Well, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Keith, for this introduction. That was um, really warm, generous, and also uh, complete. Um, I would also like to thank the organizing uh, committees of the conference for this wonderful event, and also for inviting me to give this keynote talk. I'm very happy to be here to present about this topic on gender evolution at transcript level and to present the work of my student and I at University of Sherbrooke. So I will start this talk uh, with uh, an introduction um, about gene evolution at gene level. And this will allow us to come to understand better uh, about the models and the problems, uh, the challenges of uh, reconstructing the evolution of genes at the level of transcript. And then I will finish with the contribution, existing solution uh, for gene evolution at uh, transcript level that we have produced in my team and also that were produced by um, other collaborators in the, in the, on the topic. So gene evolution at gene level is interested, it's concerned with changes at gene level. So we're interested in changes um, that um, are gained, for instance, of new genes along the evolution or the loss of old genes. And those even actually explain the difference between um, the gene trees and species trees. Okay. So for instance, here we have a representation of a gene tree with uh, five genes corresponding to species. So four species here, human, mouse, uh, cow, and, um, and chicken. And in the species tree, uh, the events at the internal nodes of the tree uh, represent speciation. So in the gene tree, we can have at events at the internal nodes of the tree that are, for instance, duplication, so duplications of genes, or again, speciations that happen at the level of species, but are also reflected at the level of uh, genes. So in this presentation, I will only talk about duplication at the level of gene trees, but there are other um, events that can explain the difference between gene trees and species trees. So for instance, we have transfer of genes, we have lineage sorting, we have hybridization. So I will limit myself to duplication uh, in this presentation. So we have duplications of genes, and then for the loss of all genes, we also have loss of genes that explain also the difference between the gene trees and, um, and the spaces trees. And so we are interested in the changes at the gene level, but also gene evolution at gene level is also interested in the consequence of this evolution on the function and the evolution of genomes. So because of the function, because we're interested in the function, we look at different types of homology relations between genes that are defined based on the, the comparison between uh, gene trees and species trees. So uh, for instance, we can define autologs. So autologs genes are a pair of genes that have di diverged from each other by a speciation event. So in the gene tree, the least common ancestor will be a speciation event. For instance, here we have H1 and M1, two genes, whose least common ancestor is a speciation. So those are autologs. And we also define paralogs. So paralogs are genes, parallel genes that have diverged by a duplication event. So for instance, here we have the genes at the left of this first duplication event and the gene at the right of this duplication event that are actually paralogs because they are separated by a duplication event. And so uh, we have the autolog conjecture that says that autolog actually um, 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 conserve uh, the sequence and also the function more than paralogs. And based on this autolog conjecture, autologs are usually used to predict conserved functions, while paralogs are used to study novel functions. So after duplication, one of the gene copy, the one that was gained, will actually gain new function and contribute to the diversification of the, of the function in the gene family. So now I will talk 
a little bit about the methods that I use to infer gene evolution at gene level. So these methods can be actually classified in three main categories, uh, depending on whether we compute first the gene tree and then the ontology pathology uh, relation or the, 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 the inverse of so first ontology pathology inference and then gene tree construction, or if we jointly reconstruct all this information. And I will go a little bit uh, inside each of the, uh, the, the this class of method because it will allow us to better understand the models uh, of gene evolution at transcript level. So for the first category, so gene tree are first reconstructed. So they are reconstructed based on a model of sequence evolution and the multiple sequence alignment. So this is given to a parsimony based or a probabilistic method that will generate a gene tree. And this gene tree will be given with uh, a model of gene family evolution uh, to a parsimony based or probabilistic reconciliation model. And this will generate actually an event, an event level gene tree. And here you, you can see that for this method, I put as input the spaces tree, but I also put as output the spaces tree. This is because depending on the method, some method will use the spaces tree as an input okay, to compute one even level gene tree. And some other method will just give several gene trees uh, at input to the method to reconstruct at the same time the even level, even lab labeled gene trees and species tree. And so for the second class of methods that I use to infer uh, gene evolution, um, we will have ontology and pathology inference first, and then based on the relation of ontology and pathology um, that will be uh, inferred, then we will reconstruct the gene tree uh, that correspond to these relations. So the input of this method are pairwise genome alignments, and then from these, based on sequence similarity, we compute uh, the autologs and paralogs uh, relations, and then we give the model of gene family evolution with this relation to a graph-based gene phylogeny reconstruction method that will reconstruct the even label gene tree and eventually a species tree. Again, species tree can be at input or input of the method. Uh, I'm sorry about the, the, the slide. I had it at the PDF format, but I don't know why at the PowerPoint format um, um, it appears like that. Sorry about that. And so the last category of method <laughs> reconstruct conjointly the gene tree and the ontology and pathology relations. So how does it do that? So as input, it takes the model of sequence evolution and the model of gene family evolution plus the multiple sequence alignment, give that to a parsimony based or a probabilistic inference method. And then from that, from that the even label gene trees are generated together with the spaces tree, all the spaces trees again are given at input. And from that, the ontology pathology relation can be inferred. So about these methods to infer uh, gene evolution at gene level, something important to notice is that genes actually are considered as basic evolutionary and functional units. Uh, and also most of these methods use this approximation that each gene is represented as a single product, uh, such as transcript or protein. But actually, um, if we're interested at the function of genes, we know that eukaryotic genes are able to produce more than one transcript, more than one protein. And so it's interesting to look at the evolution of gene at transcript level in order to be able to account for the diversity of transcript proteins and uh, functions of the gene. So I will try now to convince you about the interest um, um, of uh, reconstructing gene evolution at transcript level. So transcript actually are a refined level of functional evolution and diversity. Transcription is the first step of gene expression. And by transcription, we can construct a functional project. So transcript or protein. So for instance, here 
uh, in the illustration, we can see a gene that is uh, transcribed into a primary transcript containing both um, ex uh, exon and entrons. And then this transcript is uh, processed, for instance, here to remove the entrons by uh, splicing. And this will give the process transcript. This process transcript can be functional as it is, as a non-coding RNA, or it can be used as a proxy to be translated into a protein that will be functional as well. And so there is also the fact that the alternative processing of genes allow to produce diverse transcripts, so diverse function for the gene. For instance, we can notice in the Ansonal database currently we have uh, 45 kilo genes for the human genomes compared to 247 kilo transcripts. So you see that for a small number of genes, we may have uh, a huge number of transcripts for the, for the genome. And these transcripts actually are localized uh, in different tissue, they are localized in different times, so they, call, they, um, they often have different uh, functions and so a diverse function and it's interesting to study just um, the evolution of this diverse function. So here the illustration is one gene with a six exon and this gene allows to uh, produce free process transcripts, so T1, T2 and T3 and this uh, process transcript will allow for instance to produce uh, four coding uh, DNA sequences and four proteins by alternative transcription start and end, alternative splicing, and also alternative translation. So uh, in gene evolution at transcript level, then, we are interested for changing in the gene structure and changes in the projects, products of the gene. So for instance, here I've represented a gene tree. So it's a toy example of a gene tree, gene one, gene two, gene three with the transcript and the composition in, in exon of this transcript. And the change in exon structure will be, for instance, um, event, interesting events like the gain of exons, uh, the loss of exons, the gain of entrance, the loss of entrance. So for instance, here we can see the gene two and gene three has an additional uh, exon at the end that is not shared with gene one. So this may correspond to the next gain in the branches, in the branch of the tree that, <laughs> that go from the ancestor to the, um, from, the, from the root to the ancestor of gene two and gene three. And we can also see that uh, in gene one, we have a five print extension of the, of the second exon, which is not shared by gene two and gene three. And this may correspond also to the gain of an exon uh, in the branch that go from the root, um, the, from the root of the tree to, to gene one. So, for instance, here an exon, exonization of the part of the of the exon. And we are also interested in changes in the set of produced transcripts. So, what are the transcripts that were produced at some point of the evolution in the gene tree? So, for instance, here we can see that uh, transcript T12, the transcript of gene one. Uh, is specific to gene one, not shared with gene two and gene three. So it may have been gained in the branches that, that goes to gene one. Also, we can see that we have a transcript here in blue, when you get it in blue, so T22 and T33, that are the same, that are in gene two and gene three. And so um, since it is, doesn't appear in gene one, it could be a transcript creation, transcript that was created in the branch that goes from the root to the ancestor of gene two and gene three. And then we can also have uh, transcript creation and transcript loss even. And just like for genes, we are also interested in uh, conserved transcripts. So we call them splicing autologs. So we talked about autologs and paralogs at the level of genes. Now we talked about splicing autologs at the level of, uh, of transcripts, concept transcripts. So for instance, here in red, we can see uh, a transcript that is conserved in terms of splicing structure in gene one, gene two, and gene three. So to summarize, we're interested in models of evolution at transcript level, 
And this model of the evolution will allow us to reconstruct transcript phylogeny, so how the set of transcripts have evolved along the gene tree. Uh, so here is an example of a complete uh, scenario where at the transcript level, where we can see creations that are represented by triangles, uh, transcript creations are represented by triangles, and the transcript losses are represented by an X. So there are many challenges of uh, reconstructing gene evolution at transcript level. And I will present them, there are four that I will present, and I will show what works at gene level to reconstruct gene phylogeny that no longer work at transcript level and that require additional models. So at gene level, we have said that we could use uh, models of sequence evolution, models of gene family evolution. Well, sequence and gene family evolution, of course, are not sufficient for to reconstruct trans transcript phylogenies or to, uh, to infer slicing ontology um, at the level of transcripts. For instance, here, I will give you um, an idea of why. If we align transcript using a, a sequence only comparison, so a sequence uh, evolution model, then we will have the case that transcript of the same gene actually share a lot of the same sequence because this, the same exon of the same gene so for instance, here T11 and T12, they share this exact sequence in the gene. So they are exactly the same sequence. So it is possible that actually all transcripts of a gene will be grouped as a clad, as a clad in the phylogeny, and not reflecting then the conservation of uh, transcript between uh, several uh, genes. And, <clears throat> sorry, and also, all these methods that we have presented before actually require the alignment of exons. So in order to be able to compare transcripts, we cannot only rely on sequence. We have to rely also on the splicing structure. So we need to be able to say, to tell what are the autologous exons. Okay. And so the first challenge can be summarized actually as uh, a requirement for gene alignment model that account for gene structure. And by gene structure here, we talk about the exon entrance structure, the composition and exon of the transcript. And so the second challenge uh, is related to the model of transcript evolution. So we need model of transcript evolution that explain the evolution of transcript inside the gene tree. So the reconciliation between uh, transcript trees, transcript phylogenies and gene phylogenies. And for instance, here in the same uh, transcript tree, we can have the events at the level of transcripts that are uh, in triangle to transcript creation, uh, the X that are the transcript losses. And also in that we have the gene level, gene level events that are, for instance, duplication of genes. And we'll also have the events at the species level that are, for instance, speciations here. So the second challenge is to be able to have transcript evolution model that accounts for, for changes at the level of transcript and genes and integrate them into a single model. And the third challenge um, is that reconstructing gene evolution at transcript level actually requires model of uh, homology relationships at transcript level. Okay, We have seen that there are model of gene homology at gene level, so ontology and biology, the same must be described at the level of transcript. So for instance, here we've said here that gene one and gene two are autologs, uh, uh, par uh, paralogs, sorry, sorry, because the least common ancestor is the duplication, and gene two and gene three are autologs because the least common ancestor is a speciation. So we need to define the relation at, between transcript of autologous genes and transcript of parallelous genes. So this must be extended at the level of, of transcript, challenge three. And finally, the last challenge <clears throat> is about the transcript data. Um, actually, by working on gene evolution at transcript level, we are a little bit ahead of the time because the data is still missing. 
because uh, genomes are unequally uh, annotated. So for instance, here we can see uh, in the current release of the M sample database that human has um, 247 kilo transcript, while uh, chimpanzee, which is a close species to human, only had 61 kilo transcript that are annotated. So here we are missing some information on the transcript uh, in chimpanzee. And also there is the fact that in this database, we have different levels of confidence support for these transcripts. So actually challenge four is to be able to obtain clean and complete transcriptome data uh, in order to complete these analysis of uh, gene evolution at transcript level. So at this point, I hope I have uh, convinced you of the importance of uh, uh, studying gene evolution at transcript level and also about the challenges that are behind this, uh, this topic. And now I will talk about existing methods. So I will start by uh, existing methods that were uh, developed by Over. So we are not the only one in my team that are interested in, in those uh, problems. Over, over groups have also made uh, interesting contributions. So I will present that in the context, of course, of what we have done in my team. So these methods can be classified actually in two groups, those that are interested in gene structure and transcript uh, evolution, and those that are interested in splicing ontology efforts. So I will start with gene structure evolution and transcript phylogeny. So here I'm presenting a few of the, rep of the, of the scientific articles uh, that were published in the, in the topic. So um, they date back to uh, 15 years. So I'm presenting first um, method from Pardesial that were developed in 2008, and then uh, a method by Christina Moret in 2012 that was interested in transcript phylogenies, and also by by Ait Al in 2020 that were also interested in uh, transcript phylogeny. And I will go a little bit in the description of these methods. So Pabizial actually were the first uh, to uh, get interested in the alignment of gene structure, not only sequence alignment, but gene structure as well. So they were interested in uh, taking as input a pair of, a pair of gene structure and using dynamic programming algorithm to generate uh, pairwise gene structure alignment. So they look at uh, gene structure just as sequences, sequences of exons, and exons are regarded as nucleotides. So the same thing uh, that are used, the same dynamic programming algorithm that are used for sequence alignment are actually used for a sequence of exon alignment, okay? And so they do that in two steps. So first dynamic programming to compute the alignment, and then there is a correction step that will come back and then place the exons uh, manually uh, to, uh, to represent uh, a better alignment of the, of the chain structures. So a first contribution that was really interesting to us to challenge one though. So challenge one was the gene structure alignment. So I will show later that in our works, we have actually um, developed motor, models and methods for multiple gene structure alignment. So going from pairwise to, uh, to multiple alignment. So, and this, the, always in this, still in this category, I'll talk now about the work of Christina Tenmore and Ait Ablai Al who were interested in transcript phylogenetic reconstruction. So Christina and Moret were the first to introduce a model of transcript evolution. Uh, so this model of transcript evolution was a two-level model where we had events at the level of genes. So for instance, uh, the mutation of an exon from uh, the status of constitutive, constitutive exon to, for instance, alternative exon or to absent exon in transcript. Mm -hmm. Uh, the gain or the loss of, of exon of entrance, and then also the lower level is at the transcript level with the creation and the loss of transcript. So based on this model and giving us input, uh, a gene tree and the transcripts of uh, the, the genes at the leaves of the tree, uh, they developed a parsimony-based inference method to reconstruct transcript phylogenies. And so Ait Amlaihal also worked uh, using the same model with another algorithm, uh, taking account of the 3D structure of proteins 
to reconstruct uh, transcript phylogenies. So these are also nice contributions to challenge two, uh, so development of transcript evolution model. And we will see that in our work, we have also developed uh, models of transcript evolutions. And we also use them to recompute not all, to compute not only transcript phylogenies, but also gene phylogenies. Because just as gene family evolution can be used to reconstruct gene trees and species tree, transcript phylogeny evolution models can be used as well to reconstruct transcript phylogenies and also gene phylogenies or to correct gene trees. And so the second class of existing methods are about splicing ontology inference. So I'm presenting here uh, a few of the, of the methods that were developed um, in the past uh, 10 years or more. So Zamelia were the first to introduce the notion of splicing ontology with methods to compute slicing ontologues. Uh, Blanca Real uh, and Guido Real and other also teams also worked on reconstructing uh, splicing ontologues between different transcripts of different genes. And so all these methods actually use as input the pair of autologous genes, the transcript, autologous exons are also required, and then they give that to a transcript comparison method that will output the pairwise conserved isoforms, that are the splicing autologues, and also that will predict transcript, conserved transcript that were not annotated, for instance, from the human to the chimpanzee. So these works are actually fine contribution to challenge three. Uh, so the, the, the requirement for model of transcript uh, homology relationships, they are limited to pairs of transcript from orthologous genes. So actually in the definition of splicing orthologs, these are transcript of orthologous genes that exhibit the same splicing patterns. So the notion of ontology here comes from the level of genes. So in our work, we have extended the notion of ontology and biology to the level of transcript. It also is a fine contribution to challenge four because of the prediction of conserved transcript that contributes actually to um, uh, completing transcript on that. And so I started talking already about uh, the contribution uh, of, of my group uh, Cobius lab uh, on this uh, topic. So I recall these three, uh, four challenges, so gene structure alignment, transcript evolution model, model of transcript homology relationships, availability of complete and clean transcriptome data, and then our contribution uh, to provide solution to these uh, challenges. So I will present work, so uh, three group of work uh, that were actually led by a free uh, student uh, in the team. So the first um, set of work uh, were led by Safa Jamali, who were uh, a PhD student in the team that uh, handed her PhD in 2021. And so she worked on um, challenge one mainly, mainly to develop to, uh, multiple splice alignment algorithms. And so these were used as well uh, for gene structure alignment, homologous detecting homologous exon, conserved isoform, transcript prediction. So first contributing to challenge one, challenge three, and challenge four. And the second set of work that I will be talking about were led by another PhD student of the team who ended uh, his PhD in 2020 and is now to be an assistant professor at McGill University. So is a uh, and as I worked on a model of transcript uh, family evolution, and especially uh, in the extension of the notion of reconciliation. We know the reconciliation between gene trees and species tree. So this model was extended actually to a double reconciliation, taking account of transcript tree, uh, gene tree, and species tree. And these work were used to, for transcript and gene phylogeny reconstruction, of course. Uh, transcript homology relation and sensitive data generations as well. First contributing to uh, challenge two, challenge three, and challenge four. And finally, I will quickly present um, a recent effort that we have been working on in the team that is led by a, a PhD student, current PhD student, Davy Woodhago, who has developed a transcript-centric database called TranscriptDB. Uh, 
uh, that present actually transcript conservation and evolution uh, result within ensemble gene trees. And also, um, it, uh, David will be presenting uh, his work uh, in this conference as part of the evolved Commons session. So to get a little bit more into uh, this work, I will start with the work of Safa Jamali on multiple splice alignment. So with these two articles. And so the first work uh, was about pairwise splice alignment. Okay, pairwise splice alignment is a problem that was uh, already well known. Uh, that was based actually on sequence evolution model, mainly. And so Safa uh, worked on developing um, pairwise splice alignment uh, methods that were not only based on sequence evolution model, but also in, on splice site evolution model, exon entrance structure evolution models as well. So uh, the main work is that she developed a dynamic programming algorithm uh, to compare um, uh, transcript and gene uh, structure, taking account of these um, conjointly of these uh, models of evolution. So for instance, here, this is the main uh, recurrent formula of the, um, of the dynamic programming algorithm where we can see uh, the contribution of uh, taking account of the various uh, evolution models. So sequence, splice site, and exonentrant structure. Um, and then, um, Safa also worked on extending her work from pairwise slice alignment to multiple splice alignment, because before uh, most of the splice alignment algorithm that existed were for pairwise splice alignment, so one gene, one transcript, and then we have the splice alignment. But in order to be able to identify orthologous exons between multiple genes, we had to extend, extend pairwise splice alignment to uh, multiple splice alignment. So um, multiple splice alignment, the algorithm developed by Safa, um, takes um, a set of pairwise splice alignment from a gene family and combine them into a single multiple sequence alignment. And so how does it do that? It takes all the pairwise splice alignment and then this splice alignment I cut into uh, regions, portions, and for each genome, these portions are represented as nodes of a graph. And then uh, the pairwise splice alignment will allow to put edges between the nodes of this graph, corresponding to the alignment of regions between the genes and the transcript. And then based on that, based on this graph that it generated, we will extract connected components and connected components will correspond actually to regions that are well aligned, blocks that are well aligned in the uh, multiple splice alignment. So for instance, here we see an illustration of what is a multiple splice alignment with the identification, identification of uh, the autologous exon. Sorry, I will have a little bit of water. Thank you. Um, yes. So, like I said, these actually um, contribute then to multiple gene structure alignment, uh, to the um, identification of homologous exons, but also um, multiple splice alignment can be used to identify quickly and identify conserved isoforms. So, those that are composed of orthologous exons. And also they can be used for transcript prediction. So to transfer the prediction, the, the, the transcript annotation of one genome to another genome, which is less annotated in terms of transcript. And so uh, I will just show a little bit of the result that uh, can be obtained with the, the work of Safa. So for instance, here I am showing um, um, the comparison of uh, several uh, multiple um, gene alignment uh, uh, algorithms. 
So we have, for instance, uh, tools as close as Prank uh, for the comparison of uh, for, for generation of multiple sequence alignment. And our tool is actually the one here uh, in purple. So what we did, we computing uh, we computed the um, the accuracy of the method, so the precision, the recall, and uh, the F score, and also the time taken to compute uh, these alignments. And we consider three data sets. So a data set of genes that are really close in terms of uh, sequence similarity and gene structure similarity, uh, a medium set in terms of similarity, and then genes that were less, uh, that were more um, distant in terms of uh, sequence similarity and gene structure similarity. And what you can see here is that actually our method is able to um, perform well uh, and to be robust to the change in, changes in the, um, in the sequence similarity between genes. So we can see that it is almost constant here, robust. And it also, uh, in terms of time, takes as much time as uh, um, the less, um, um, the, 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 the most quick uh, methods here. And so in the right here, I'm just showing a picture of what we can obtain using multiple splice alignment. So here we can see this is on the top, uh, the general structure of gene family. And then we have genes here, uh, one, two, uh, three genes here with the transcript and the transcripts are also aligned with the genes, and we can see very well the conservation of the exons and the, the conservation of transcript to study the evolution after that, based on the multiple splice alignment. And so now I will talk about the second uh, set of works that were produced in the team. So that were mainly the work of Ezai uh, Kuiche for his, for his PhD. So here, uh, the contribution was a model of transcript family evolution, and the extension of the notion of reconciliation to transcript tree and gene tree reconciliation. And I will present more in deep uh, the results of this work. So this extension actually allowed uh, to, com to combine both the reconciliation, for instance, here in the illustration, the model here gives us the reconciliation between a species tree in black and a gene tree um, in, uh, in red in which we can see uh, the uh, gene duplication events and gene loss event. And then this gene tree here, that is, rep is replicate, rep replicated here uh, in red, so the, the, um, the, the embedding tree in red, and then the transcript tree is represented in blue inside the gene tree with a transcript creation and transcript loss event. And so, for this, we use this model in order to reconstruct even labeled transcript trees as well as gene trees, and then to infer the transcript and ontology biology um, relations. So the model is a, a parsimony-based inference method that take as input uh, the genes and the transcript and the multiple splice alignment. And gene trees can be uh, taken as input if we want, for example, to, re to reconstruct only one able event level transcript tree, or they can also be uh, output, gene tree can, can also be output here if we take several genes, families with the transcript and we want to reconstruct jointly both the transcript trees and the gene trees and the gene tree for the gene family. And so, Based on this uh, reconciliation model explaining the evolution of transcript inside gene tree, we were able actually to extend the notion of ontology and biology to transcript, from gene to transcript. So for instance, here we can see we have talked about autologs and parallels at the level of genes. And then it's the same at the level of transcript. We can define this time autologs and parallels based on the event that are events that are at the level of transcript. So at the level of transcript, we have talked about transcript creation and transcript loss. So they act as gene duplication and gene loss at the level of gene. So two transcripts will be orthologous if the least common ancestor in the transcript tree is a creation. So this means two different transcripts evolving in the same gene, just as two different genes by duplication evolving in the same spaces. 
and then the other type of autology relation will be uh, parallax here when the event that uh, that separated them are uh, it um, um, a creation sorry uh, it's the opposite i'm sorry of what i say so parallax are those whose um, least common ancestor is a creation and all the other one are actually autologs and to make the distinction between gene level and transcript level we simply added a prefix so transcripts are autologs or parallels, but they can be in autologous genes or parallelous genes. So if transcripts are autologs and there are in autologous genes, we have a, we added prefix, so there are auto autologs. If there are in parallelous genes, we had a prefix para, so there are para autologs. And the same here. So for instance, here we can see that gene two and gene three are actually autologs. So uh, all the relations between genes of gene 2, between transcript of gene 2 and gene 3, will have the prefix auto. And then we can have here in red auto autologs, and we can also have in blue para autologs between gene 1 and gene 2 and gene 1 and gene 3, because the least common ancestor here is a duplication, so the genes are parallels. And then we can also de define auto parallels and para parallels in the same way. And so this allows to extend uh, the notion of autology biology, not only to autologous genes, but also to transcript of autologous and paralogous genes. And we now know exactly what we are computing. So what was called before splicing autologs was actually auto-autologs in this new framework. And so uh, the second contribution by Ezai is um, uh, a simulator uh, to um, generate sensitive transcript of data, because we have said that we have a problem with the lack of data, uh, data that are not uh, complete, that may contain errors, but we still need to be able to test the method that we are developing. So before being able to obtain the data from experimental uh, um, uh, studies, which is ongoing with uh, the development of uh, rna um, uh, technologies, we can use synthetic data. And so this contribution was given a gene tree as input here to be able to generate uh, the evolution of the genes at the level of sequence, so the, the sequence of the genes, as well as the evolution of the gene structure of the gene. And finally, at the lower level, inside that, the evolution of the set of transcripts that are uh, generated by, uh, by the genes. So uh, the models that are considered here are the model of sequence evolution, model of gene structure evolution, as well as alternative splicing events at the level of transcript. So this year allowed to, um, uh, to develop transcript and gene phobotology uh, um, reconstruction methods, as well as to uh, define and extend the notion of homology relations to transcript, and finally to generate uh, synthetic data uh, synthetic data for um, the purpose of testing methods uh, on uh, the reconstruction of uh, gene evolution at transcript level. And uh, so I will just present a few results quickly uh, of this work. So here I'm presenting uh, the results of the reconstruction of transcript phylogeny that were obtained using our methods compared to what was obtained using FireML based on uh, sequence evolution model. So we can observe what I was talking about before, that the color correspond to the same genes. So these are transcripts and the color correspond to the same genes. And we can see that actually uh, because uh, the transcripts are really uh, close to each other, they share almost the same exon, all transcripts of the same genes are, are clustered together. Okay, why in our case, we can see that taking account of the slicing structure actually works and uh, allow to see uh, less creation in the tree. So this is the same here that was done uh, with uh, TP53 TP uh, family. Uh, we see that there is only two families here in uh, red and uh, blue that were mixed uh, using only sequence. But in our case, so the distribution allows to have less, um, to, to, to see less um, events of transcript creation, which is more plausible. And so finally, uh, the last 
contribution I will talk about. I will talk not much, too much about that. It's about the transcript transcript database. Like I said, this will be a presentation in the Evolve Commission session. So this is a work uh, that was done, that is currently done by Denis Wilhavo in the team uh, about this. So transcript data is actually a transcript that is centered, uh, uh, database that is centered uh, towards the transcript rather than towards the genes. So it allows to uh, retrieve title, different types of homology relations between transcript, to retrieve transcript trees and gene trees, uh, to display comparative genomics data, and there are also tools that are added for data analysis and processing. The data can be exported, and therefore there is an API uh, to uh, to use this tool actually uh, as input of, of some other methodological uh, pipelines. Uh, so there are gene level resources and transcript level resources. I will also present only present about the transcript uh, based resources. So we have the information about the transcript cluster. So groups of auto of uh, autologous uh, transcript. We have the information of the gene structure in one uh, gene, in one transcript. We also have the information for multiple transcripts that are aligned, so families of transcript corresponding to transcript of the gene family. Um, and a lot of the visualization tool before the export of the of the data. And finally, you can also see for a given gene tree with the transcript uh, of the genes, what are the conserved transcripts. So you can you can visualize uh, the transcripts that are conserved uh, within the, the genes in the gene family. So uh, this will be a presentation in the, if you want to see more about that, you can attend the presentation of uh, David with, with Raoul. Unfortunately, he was not able to attend the conference in person because of the um, problem with the visa requirement, but it will be online. So to conclude, uh, I've presented our contribution uh, to gene um, tree reconstruction um, at the level of transcript, so reconstructing gene evolution at the level of transcript, a contribution to, with solution to the four challenges that um, I presented so with multiple gene structure alignment that use exon entrance structured information to be more accurate, but also the extension of uh, reconciliation, uh, phylogenetic tree reconciliation to transcript gene and species tree reconciliation with the use of that to reconstruct transcript trees as well as gene trees. I presented about the definition of transcript homology relationships, sorry, for transcript of both orthologous and parologous genes, and also have presented uh, works for transcript, the, the prediction of transcript, prediction of concept transcript, synthetic data generation, and transcript and transcript scientific database. So the perspective of, the, of this work are um, a lot, okay, but I will focus on the perspectives related to uh, uh, the models of evolution. So the models of evolution that we have considered up to now are very simplistic. Uh, at the level of genes, we consider gene uh, duplication and gene losses, but there are many other events that can be integrated in the models, like transfer, linear sorting, conversion, hybridization. The same for gene structure evolution, we consider exon gain and losses, entron gain and losses, but there are other events like the change in exon status, for instance, uh, an exon that passed that goes from uh, constitutive to alternative or constitutive to absent. And also there are other events uh, like exon uh, extension reductions, five prime extension, uh, uh, three prime extension, that can be interesting to be integrated in the model. And finally, for transcript evolution model, we have considered transcript creation and losses, but there are other events uh, that are underlying actually the evolution of transcript, which are the um, uh, alternative splicing events that can be integrated actually in the in the model as well and would allow to uh, reconstruct a more accurate transcript trees but also can be used to to improve the reconstruction of gene trees and species trees so i would like to end the presentation uh by thanking um, some people so i'd like to first thank the the members of the group the cobius lab um, at the University of Sherbrooke, especially the three students that have 
for, from which uh, for which I've, I've presented uh, the contribution. So Safa Jamadi, Isaiah Kuchi, and Devi Widrago. And all the other students that have also contributed to this work or have contributed to a discussion about this work. I also want to uh, thank my collaborators, people with whom we have been working, with whom we have uh, discussed, so Manuel Lafont uh, at the Department of Computer Science with me at the University of Chevreau, Brendan Bell at the Department of um, at the, at the Faculty of, Me of Medicine, sorry, at the University of Sherbrooke, different from uh, our faculty. Yanis Nevers and Christophe Desimos as well from University of uh, Lausanne. And finally, I would like to thank my, uh, my family. Uh, so my three children and my mom, Madeleine, who is uh, at home taking care of my kids so that I can attend uh, the conference. And also, um, I would like to thank the, the many nannies, uh, in particular, at the moment, Erika and Ella, who are taking care of my kids as well. And so I'd like to end by thanking as well the, um, those who have, um, who have given fundings for this work. So uh, the Canada Research Chair, um, the ANSWER, um, the um, Quebec uh, uh, funding uh, agencies, MITACS, and the University of Sherbrooke. And so, <laughs> Before finishing, uh, I would like to feel uh, uh, to uh, Thomas Lenga will ask me to add this uh, this slide at the end of the presentation because I'm an associate editor of the, the, the new journal uh, Bioinformatic Advances. Uh, so to invite you, so I'm doing a lot of bit of advertisement to invite you to submit your work in the journal. So the two editor in chiefs are here. So Thomas Lenga and Alex Batman. So if you have questions, so the John is doing very well, and uh, we have a great team of uh, editors that are working very hard um, for you to, to have your, your papers uh, reviewed very quickly. So thanks a lot uh, for, your, uh, for, for, for listening to me, and uh, I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. And they seem like a very powerful set of methods, uh, and I can immediately think of applications of problems I'm interested in. I'm wondering what the time scale uh, over which these exon intron structures can serve. Is that mammals, people back vertebrates, metazoa? Yes, uh, thank you for your question. Indeed, uh, the conservation of this exon, so we have observed. Uh, Conserve, transcript, conserve eggs and up to mammals or even to metazoan. But of course, um, the more distant the spaces are, uh, the more it's difficult to see the conservation uh, at the sequence and even at the spicing structural level. So um, when we do manual alignment with sequences, what we have observed is what we, when we do alignment based on, sequ based on sequences, uh, we miss some uh, autology relationships between eggs and. But when we add the notion of uh, exon entrance structure, we can go even from mammal to metazoan and still be able to see uh, conservation of exons uh, and then we can use that to reconstruct actually transcript phylogenies. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks for a great talk. I really enjoyed it. So I have um, one second, Alex. Okay, hopefully that's working now. Okay. Right. Uh, great talk, Ada really uh, enjoyable. So it also gave me lots of questions. And so I wonder if you now have these great techniques for understanding the transcript evolution. And I was wondering about applying them to understand how, you know, the, the rules that apply to the evolution of transcripts. And in particular, um, you know, channeling Michael Press and Alfonso Valencia, uh, the, the primary transcripts, do they have different evolutionary sort of pattern to the non climate transcripts, and is that something you've looked into? Thank you. Another very interesting question. Uh, we haven't looked at that. We have looked at uh, process transcript. And then, so the first part of your question was about uh, can we use actually those models to be able to know what is actually happening uh, as events at the level of transcript? 
uh, yes, uh, so more events will appear when we have the multiple splice alignment. We will, we will see uh, events of evolution at the level, for instance, of the gene structure that we didn't know before. Um, and also, um, for primary transcript evolution, we haven't looked at that yet, but yes, once we have the evolution of the transcript and we look at the evolution of the primary transcript, we may have more um, um, knowledge about the kind of events that happen for particularly, for particularly those uh, uh, primary transcripts. Thank you. Uh, well, this work. Um, uh, very nice talk. I uh, really enjoyed it. I have a, a very basic question, and that is: um, now, has the transcript evolution altered in any way the current concept of species evolution? Has it has it started to change what you think is you know the kind of classical species evolutions out there? Have you started to look at that? Thank you. <laughs> I'm lucky. A very interesting question as well. Um, so, like I said, recently, uh, many teams have been starting uh, to work on the, well, on the joint um, reconstruction of both gene trees and species trees. So the mix the model of uh, uh, gene evolution um, and the model of species evolution to reconstruct both at the same time. And the same happens when we consider transcript evolution. I have said that uh, in my team, we're interested in using that in order to reconstruct more accurate gene trees. But I have also talked about the double reconciliation, which consider both uh, the free, sorry, transcript trees, uh, gene trees, and species trees. So actually, we think that even uh, species trees can be uh, more accurately reconstructed when we consider transcript. But like I said, the real um, level of evolution, actually, of functional evolution, are transcript engines. So we can use that to reconstruct better um, species trees. Yeah, thank you. I have a, just a small follow-up, and that is, you know, different organs may have, maybe have different splicing forms out there. How do you choose which organs to use for your for your models of splice evolution or transcript evolution? Thank you. That is a perspective that should have been added as well. Yes, you are right because at the moment we use all the available transcripts for a gene. We don't consider the support level of the gene. We don't consider uh, the spaces in, in which they are appear. We don't consider at what time they have appeared in the in the life of the. Of the, of the organism, but all these are um, equations, are features that should be taken into account if we want to look at the functional evolution of the transcript, uh, not only based on uh, in which genes the, the, to which genes they belong, but also in which tissue, at what time uh, during the evolution they have appeared. So these are all interesting questions that should be added in the models. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Aida. I, I have a colleague who has an experimental colleague who has a family like this, and I have a whole new appreciation of just how hard this question is now. Um, I, you talked about the work where you're adding transcript creation and transcript loss. To, and transcripts, you can get new transcripts by actually gaining an exon or losing an exon, and then you can also get differences in which exons are included, and in some cases you have transcripts that are supersets of another transcript and other ones you have you know overlap but neither one contains the other can you comment a little more about how you deal with those events okay uh, very interesting question thank you danny um so first of all all these events are not at the same level so exon gain loss that have a consequences at the level of transcript are at the level of genes so actually, they will be counted. Uh, we will count on. Um, we will count them at the level of genes, while transcript creation of lo or loss will be uh, considered at the level of uh, of transcript. So this is for the first part of the equation. But actually, you you are right. So when we when we compare the transcripts, for for now, uh, we just consider 
compare traffic based on the composition in Exxon. But actually, like I said, behind that, we have alternative splicing. So we must integrate alternative splicing models with the different uh, events of alternative splicing to be able to compare transcripts based on alternative splicing events. And then, for instance, reconstruct scenarios for parsimony-based uh, uh, approaches to reconstruct the shortest um, alternative splicing scenario to explain the difference between two transcripts. So, but if you deal with gain of exponent at the level of gene, but the, the low side or is all yeah. Well, the gain of exon uh, at the level of genes can be also between paralogous genes. L like I said, uh, because of the orthodox conjecture, we think that when the duplication happens, a gene will gain new function. So this gain of new function may happen with the gain of new exon or the gain of, uh, of new entron. And so this is at the level of genes. We will count that at the level of genes. And then uh, the consequence of this at the level of the transcript will not be counted. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Go to the right. Thank you very much for your talk, Adrian. Um, so I, I thought you made a really beautiful illustration, for instance, with the, with the TP63 on how disruptive like the current mode uh, that we all use, with, which is the basic alignment, can be. And also that point that there's and just a handful of, of genomes that have, like, let's say, uh, like a large enough like a repertoire of transcripts. And so this is a bit depressing at a time where there's so many genomes that are being sequenced, but the state of like the, the annotation remains very, very poor. And so I wonder. I mean, to, to me, it sounds like it's connecting like quite a few of the communities here at SNP, you know, the alignment, community, the regulation, evolution, and it seems like, uh, I mean. But, but that we, we're not doing so much progress. I mean, your, your group is certainly pioneering there, but I mean, what do you think needs to happen in terms of uh, you know, method development so that you know, within five or 10 years of the you know, SME, we have the more exhaustive uh, transcript annotation across all of the species and uh, you know, better line methods that, that can actually take advantage of this? Because it seems like the, the challenge ahead of us is, is immense. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much, Christoph. Um, very interesting um, point. So, yes, so we see that when we uh, reconstruct trans transcriptology, uh, um, um, transcriptologies, and when we reconstruct um, splicing ontology um, um, relations between transcripts, we use uh, many different uh, aspects of bioinformatics that are represented as different causes here. Uh, yes, indeed, we should have more integrated uh, approaches. We should have uh, teams of uh, experts uh, working on uh, transcript phylogeny uh, reconstruction. Uh, for instance, you have the quest of autolots uh, that uh, you are leading with um, some other people. That is also interesting. So the same should be done, for instance, for uh, the reconstruction of evolution at the level of transcript. Uh, because, like you said, uh, <coughs> we are using many different uh, information uh, from different topics that are all represented in bioinformatics and especially here uh, at ISM. So it takes group efforts. Yes. Um, here. Um, so thank you very much for a really, really uh, interesting talk. And actually, I have been changing my question as you have been answering uh, all the questions and I really appreciate it. So uh, well, one of the points in your presentation was um, the complete transcriptomes and the errors that we have. And um, um, we are now facing uh, all the information that is uh, coming from uh, the uh, non-grid sequencing technologies. Um, that are able to sequence uh, single molecules, right, and single molecule transcripts. And they are providing us a landscape that for me is really, really scary of a huge amount of uh, uh, transcript diversity that we are seeing in one single experiment, right? So it's like, um, I don't know what we are going to be doing uh, with this information in, in the reference transcriptomes, describing the complexity of the transcriptomes. So my first uh, of my initial question uh, to you was how 
you think that you can deal with the identification of problems in this scenario in which uh, you know first that uh, the number of sources can expand maybe like uh, by order of magnitudes because of this uh, and also that's they will probably be very dynamic uh, uh, changes in the definition uh, maybe at some point. But actually, maybe it's even more interesting for me and the opposite question that is, how can uh, the approach of uh, the study of the evolutionary relationships help us to uh, identify which are the transcripts that are really the words to add mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is interesting. I will try to answer actually both of your questions. So the first question is about the use of um, RNA-seq data, uh, those that allow to produce short reads as well as, as, well as long reads. Um, we haven't worked on that, but I know for phylogeny, re uh, phylogeny reconstruction, several groups are now uh, trying to work on reconstructing the phylogenies based on read data rather than based on the assembled uh, transcript or assembled genes. So this is something that is also uh, uh, pertinent for transcript phylogeny reconstruction. About the, the second part um, of the equation, which was, uh, sorry, can you So uh, the, the thing is that we are assuming that each number of these transcripts were well available. Transcript yes, transcript. okay, right. which so transcript? The question is uh, how you can help us to describe the transcript. Which, which, what are the transcripts that are worth to be annotated? Uh, well, I think one important thing is the notion of conservation okay uh, when a transcript is uh, well actually everything is important the, the, the notion of conservation uh, gives us um, let us think that uh, a transcript that is conserved between several genes in a gene tree um, such a transcript has importance uh, from a functional point of view so this is an important transcript to be annotated because it was conserved uh, along the evolution between the different genes uh, so and but also transcripts that are appear only in one gene for example recent creation of transcript may query uh, new functions so there may be as well uh, the, the, the gain of new function from the genes so all these can bring us to uh, um, to, to, to direct our interest towards some particular genes whether we're interested in the function so conserve or if one's interested, for instance, uh, in the creation of new um, of new uh, new function. Okay. Nice talk. Okay. So when there is like, there is a deletion on the genome, you basically you know, lose the information. So during evolution, you know, it's more it's very hard to predict the deletion event. In the evolution. So, for example, here we are not handling the division event, we are only handling the duplicate event, right? Mm -hmm. And then, but, but for the transcript level, we are also looking at the you know, exome loss event. So, I just wondering how you are handling those loss events at the transcript level, like how the model works for the loss of exomes. Okay, uh, thank you. So, the question is about. Um, um, how do we um, handle um, the same actually uh, even at the level of genes and at the level of transcript? For instance, uh, uh, gene loss, uh, how does it uh, integrate, how does, is it integrated with the transcript loss? So, uh, for instance, I will take the gene, so we have the even at the level of genes and we have the even at the level of uh, transcript. So, a gene loss event will result in the loss of all the transcript for these genes since the gene is lost. In the species, then all the transcript transcripts will be lost. But in our reconstruction model, only the gene level event will be counted because the other event at the level of transcript are actually consequences of this event at the level of genes. So all that is about actually about where the events are placed in our uh, multi scale representation, whether they are at the level of species, counted there, at the level of gene, counted there, or at the level of transcript. Thank you for your question. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. And I was wondering how your uh, how your program handles something like non-coding RNAs that are 
significantly evolutionarily constrained and then on top of it played by a completely different set of evolutionary rules such that they really don't care about codon sequencing but instead care about how for example a splice site could stay put or how uh, the structure could be maintained over the course of you know different uh, species. Mm -hmm. And thank you uh, again for the interesting question. Yes, so, uh, well, we're interested in um, alternatively spliced uh, genes. So these are mainly, for non-coding uh, uh, genes, there will be many um, non-coding non RNA genes that also uh, go through alternative splicing. And so depending, because we, are, we have various models, we have models of sequence evolution, but we have also a model of splicing structure evolution that will be interesting for non-coding RNA, long non-coding RNA. But also for non-coding RNA, it will be interesting to look at the evolution of structure. And then by structure here, I mean about the, the folding structure of RNA. So yeah, so this is also interesting. So we go from complex to more complex model. And uh, depending on the, on the genes in which we are interested, we can choose one model to integrate my one model or to remove some models that are less interesting for the kind of genes that we are studying. Thank you. Last question. Thanks for sharing this with Santa Monica. I actually, uh, I have a follow-up question on the non-coding RNA. So um, have you ever observed um, a faster evolutionary rate on non-coding RNA, I mean, on non-coding transcripts and coding transcript is, is why we let's concentrate on it. Okay, uh, so the question is about um, um, the evolution of non-coding RNA versus uh, coding RNA. Is it faster? Have we observed faster evolution for non-coding RNAs? Uh, very interesting question. Also, for now, we have applied our our tools mainly to uh, coding RNAs, okay, to coding transcript, but as there are the models can be also applied to the evolution of uh, non-coding RNA transcripts, and so this is something that can be done. So I I don't have the, the answer to, to to this question about the difference in the, uh, the 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 evolution, the difference of evolution rate of evolution between the two, but I guess for sequence evolution, non-coding RNA will evolve uh, faster than uh, coding RNAs. I haven't observed that, but since uh, the function is more at the level of structural um, uh, folding, so we expect that uh, sequence with, will evolve faster, but the structure then will evolve, uh, will be conserved, more conserved between uh, in the same family. A quick technical question uh, is that, uh, do you consider it as necessary to um, sequence the transcription from um, all the tissues we bring in a novel species into the tree because you 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 emphasize the complete transcription and, you, you, and also the other device is highly species specific. Yeah, thank you. So the question is about the, the availability of data. Uh, is it interesting to consider um, um, sequencing uh, transcription data from all the tissues uh, possible in, in uh, organized? Yeah, that's interesting, but it has a cost as well. So yeah, the, uh, we want the complete construct of data. We will we will get to that using um, uh, sequencing technology, but also computational technology to help with the transfer of uh, annotation from one genome to the other. So both of them sh should lead us to be able to obtain uh, better transcriptome annotation that are complete and that are clean as well. Thank you. Hello, I, this doesn't seem to be working. Not working. Hey, yes. It is working. Is it working? Yeah. Oh. Hello? Yeah. Any, anyway, there's a, we have a question that came in online. And the basic question is, there's a wide variation in the degree of understanding of different organisms in terms of the data. And so how do you take what you're learning with the better studied organisms and how can you extrapolate that to help us uh, deal with the less well studied organisms like okay. your technology? 
Thank you very much. So this is related as well to the previous question about the availability of complete and clean data. So actually, the work that we are doing, especially the one, the first part for multiple splice alignment, allows actually to um, to transfer the annotation from some genomes that are very well annotated uh, to other genomes that are less well annotated. Because when we see that there is a concern. Uh, gene structure between two genes from two different uh, organs, one well annotated and the other one less annotated, then we can use this information to transfer actually in order to be able to augment uh, the, um, the annotation of the spaces that lack um, transcript annotations. 